What a beautiful group. I think we're going to get started. I think we're going to get started. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Renee Wilson Simmons. And as executive director of the ACE Awareness Foundation in Memphis, and on behalf of Building Strong Brains Tennessee, it is my distinct honor to be here today to move all of us through this impressive program. It's going to be enlightening, it's going to be energizing, and it's going to be inspiring. And you have my promise on that. So I am the summit moderator, and I'll be guiding you through the day of what I'm sure you've noticed if you've looked at the agenda is an ambitious one. But it has to be ambitious, and that's what the summit organizers realized when they began planning for it, because there are several important objectives to be accomplished. And the first is to celebrate the many successes of champions in research and policy and practice and advocacy. And the second is to think creatively about what's next, of what our commitment can be, what we'll learn today from everyone we hear, from the work that's being displayed in posters around the room, in the discussions that people have today in their networking, I think even to the reception this evening, to think creatively about the innovations that must continue as we enter a new phase in this state's history. And it has been said that children are living messages we send to a time we will not see. They're living messages of a time we will not see. And so we've come together today to acknowledge the progress we've made to ensure Tennessee children's healthy development and to ensure that the messages that they transport from their generation to the next and the next and the next are filled with hope and brightened with possibility. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Deputy Governor Jim Henry to open the summit for us. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of all the work that's gone on in the last three years, and especially since I attended the first um, foundation meeting that was in Memphis and uh, the ACES Foundation. And I never will forget one of the remarks that was made there. A.C. Wharton, A.C., are you here? I know you're always at everything, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, there was about 200 of the most important people in Memphis there. And I went down at the request of the First Lady to kind of represent and see what we should be doing. And at the end of that, I was so impressed with the presentation and so impressed with all the people that there were there that took the time to go. Many of the business leaders and many of the uh, political leaders and state and city, and, and it was just impressive. And AC got up at the end of it and he said, I am determined and this city is determined to not lose another generation of Memphis children. And so it made me really rec recognize what an innovative thing this was. And I don't know most of your background, but let me tell you a little bit about me. I was raised, born and raised in Madisonville, Tennessee, about 30 miles from the Teleco Mountains. My family had been in Madisonville for 100 years. And my mother and dad had been married by the time it was over almost 60 years. I had 50 relatives within 25 miles of Madisonville that watched everything I did. If I went to school, my aunt was there. If I went down to the dime store, I had another aunt was there. My uncle worked at the grocery store. So as a child coming up, I had plenty of people that were tutoring me. That's not the world that we grow up in now. And our kids do not have that sport. So I think it is so timely that we've taken on this initiative, done everything, and we're doing everything we can, not to only to be involved, but leading the nation makes me very proud. Now I want to introduce to you Chief Justice Bivens, 
to for a few remarks, and I'd like to ask Justice, is Justice Lee here? And Justice Holly Kirby and the Administrative Office of the Court and our friend Debbie Tate, could y'all please stand while Justice Bivens makes a few brief remarks. Thank you, Jim. It is a pleasure to be here with you here today. I, I think that this is a, a shining example of the unprecedented cooperation that we have seen during Governor Haslam's administration between the three branches of government here in Tennessee. It is a strong uh, recognition that together we can make a difference. And through the efforts of Governor Haslam and First Lady Chrissy Haslam, in particular through this initiative uh, and the work the, uh, through the ACES initiative and 3BI, we have seen the development and the training of many folks. In the judicial branch alone, we have now trained over 1,000 people. That includes judges at all levels uh, of our judiciary as well as the court staffs involved. That training can lead to helping children as we go and proceed it, it today. I had the privilege of being uh, a part of a, sim, of a symposium recently in, in Greenville, Tennessee, that First Lady Chrissy Haslam was there for, in which we talked specifically about poverty as an adverse childhood experience and about the ability of plotting that through neuroscience and treating that. I think the neuroscience aspect of this and the training offers us such great opportunities to develop better programs and better treatment for our children to make this a better uh, world for this next generation. I wanna say a special thank you to the First Lady and to the Governor and to Jim Henry, to everyone involved in this initiative because it truly is making a difference in the state of Tennessee and it's a pleasure on behalf of the judiciary to represent this branch of government to say we are happy and honored to be a part of that commitment. Thank you. Good. Judge Lee, Judge Kirby, and Debbie, could you all all stand up and be recognized at this time? Thank you. And I would like to also recognize many members of the cabinet that are here. Could you all all stand at this time? Thank you. And also our elected officials from across the state, if you could stand at this time, and our state legislature. Thank you. Let me just say that uh, all of this, and uh, there are many people involved that deserve the credit, but no one more than the governor of our state and Mrs. Haslam. I will tell you this much. The funding, the support, the back of all these workers out here, you can't imagine it, it could have happened without the full support of the governor. Our governor has made a lot of changes. Ms. Haslam has made a lot of changes in this state, all for the better. The next generation is gonna be better and have a better chance to succeed of what this governor and first lady have done. We will miss them when they're gone, I will assure you. At this time, I'd like to introduce the governor and the first lady. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. When they, uh, when they write the history of our state, uh, Jim Henry will be there between every line. Uh, he has uh, been a state representative, a mayor. He's uh, been the commissioner of a couple departments. He's now the deputy governor. Throughout all those roles and throughout his professional life, he has been about those who are the most vulnerable in our society, and he has made a dramatic impact, and we appreciate it. It is really good to be here. As uh, is, is Deputy Governor Henry said, this is an impressive room of folks. I look out, and one of the things about being on your last legs, if you will, of being uh, in office, is you realize how many people you've gotten to know and what uh, how many incredible people there are that are working in so many different ways to make things happen. And if the people say to me all the time, well, will you miss this? And I always answer, well, I'll miss part of it. <laughs> but the part I'll really miss um, is being uh, a part of a larger group of people who really are focused on changing things. 
If you look in this room, there's, there's scores of people who every day are thinking about how do we make children's lives better. Uh, there are, by my count, 10 commissioners of departments for the state. Uh, we have uh, three Supreme Court justices. We have the Attorney General. Uh, we have three senators, two state uh, House members. Uh, and then I could go on with, uh, and fill the room with who are the folks that are here. But it's a picture of how and why things are working so well in this state, uh, and we are very, very grateful. So thank you, Jim. Chrissy and I are, are honored to be a, a part of this and to see the faces around this room. Uh, let me, before I get going, maybe take a, a moment to, for all of us to think about the significance of today. Everybody in this room can remember where you were 17 years ago this morning. I'm, I'm willing to take that bet, that everybody here can remember that. It was obviously a traumatic event for our entire country, uh, for some families, uh, incredibly so. Uh, but all of us remember the weight uh, of that day and the impact it's had on us since then. It's uh, fitting then that we would come together today uh, to focus on preventing trauma uh, and the community uh, conditions that contribute to trauma. As we celebrate the contributions we've made uh, together to provide better outcomes for Tennessee's children uh, and families. All right, my turn. <laughs> so it is really largely thanks to all of you in this room uh, here today that we're uh, able to reflect on how far we've come as a state. We've come a long way in mitigating and preventing hopefully adverse childhood experiencing experiences and promoting recovery in educating the public about ACEs and trauma-informed care. Um, in changing the culture in Tennessee, and I do think we're starting to change the culture from uh, asking what's wrong with this child to what happened to this child. And Bill and I have both made Tennessee's children a priority um, since he was elected the, from the very beginning of his administration. The Building Strong Brains Initiative has been uh, very important to us and a part of uh, the message that we've carried across the state as we've gone. Um, but more importantly, I think it's become a a powerful driving force behind much of the work that we do. You know, the, the tagline for, the, uh, for today uh, is perfect, I think. Uh, celebrating successes and imagining possibilities. You know, whether it's a great team, a great school, a great business, um, whatever it is, I think they combine those two things. So we don't forget to celebrate successes. We, we, we have a habit of doing that sometimes. We tend to think of what we're doing wrong and all the issues. We don't celebrate successes enough. Uh, and then, but if you're gonna be great, you also imagine the possibilities. And uh, I'm very pleased that we will be doing both of those today. At my very first State of the State address, uh, almost eight years ago, I said, you know, that if we'll make the right decisions and focus on the right things, we can compete with anyone, uh, any other state. I, I honestly think Tennessee can compete with and end up at the top. Uh, a lot of folks kind of scratched their head and said, well, do you really mean that? And the answer then was yes, and the answer now is yes. Uh, because of the commitment uh, that folks in this room have made, uh, we are a better state. Because of the commitment that folks in this room and a lot of other places, um, we have uh, the lowest unemployment we've had in history. More, more Tennesseans have a job. We've made astounding education progress where we're still the fastest improving state in the country. We have the highest graduation rate. We're the first state to let uh, everybody have two years free of community college and technical school. Um, it's all based upon this idea that we can compete with anyone if we'll make the right decisions uh, and bring the right people to the table. And I will say Tennessee is, I think, leading the nation in the vital work we're doing to address ACEs through the Building Strong Brains Tennessee initiative. I've been so privileged to be a part of, uh, of different things across the state and the nation. Um, I've been to several national meetings on this topic. I've convened with other first spouses who are interested in this and national experts. And just last week, I was in Johnson City for a wonderful uh, program there where about half of the attendees there were, were from out of state coming to Tennessee to learn what we're doing here and how we're doing it um, and how we're making such progress. Um, so I can tell you firsthand that I, I really do believe we're at the forefront of this movement. I think Tennessee has a just a wonderfully unique strategy um, that you know, we're gonna hear more about today and learn more 
even uh, go forward in what we know. I, I know how impactful it's been and it was gonna continue to be uh, also because our legislature uh, and the governor have dedicated resources to ACEs related uh, training and activities and that 2.45 million in recurring dollars in the budget is something that I am really, really excited about. One of the best parts, yeah. Thank you. One of the best parts about being governor or first lady is getting to see all the firsthand, firsthand all the things, the contributions that each of our state departments and agencies um, make to initiatives like this, both separately and together. So thank you to our Children's Cabinet, to the Three Branches Institute, and so many others. Our agencies are breaking down silos and they're coordinating efforts and working in concert uh, to create the best outcomes for children. In, in almost, uh, I guess, almost eight years that uh, Bill has been in office, we've watched departments and state government and our partner agencies accomplish so much good work. And we wanted to ensure that that story was being told. So um, the future leaders of Tennessee can understand the importance of these efforts and, and hopefully continue that great momentum forward. So my office, in conjunction with the Children's Cabinet, uh, the ACES Awareness Foundation and others, has put together a report um, highlighting some of those initiatives that have improved the lives of children and families across the state. And although it's gonna be officially released tomorrow, you get the sneak peek, you get the first copy here today on your, uh, hopefully at your table, at your seat, you'll see a copy of a, of a new report titled Prioritizing Tennessee's Children, Our Promise to Future Generations. And I hope later today you'll have a chance to look at it and read it uh, through and, and just learn more about how Tennessee is working to serve our families. It's a report not of solving every problem, but but of momentum, and we want, uh, we want to, everyone to know the momentum that we are making, and uh, hopefully that that momentum will continue. And now you see why most people say we elected the wrong Haslam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being a part of this day. Uh, as we look to the future, uh, we can do this in Tennessee. We can lead the nation in preventing trauma. Uh, we can lead the nation in eliminating adverse childhood experiences. We can do that here. And as I look around the room, uh, you all believe that. Um, it is an extraordinary opportunity to have given, uh, to have done what Chrissy and I have had the chance to do for the last several years. Uh, but we leave even more excited than when we came because we uh, see the quality of the people involved and we see the commitment. And then we see, I think, a little bit what Chief Justice Bivens talked about, the the ingenuity and the strategy uh, to actually make it happen instead of just coming together and talking about good things. So uh, on behalf of 6.6 uh, .6 million Tennesseans today and a whole lot uh, who aren't here today but will benefit from what you're talking about, thank you. Uh, it is an exciting time to be a part of uh, what's happening in Tennessee. Thanks so much. Just like to present to the governor and first lady the uh, Building Strong Brains Tennessee Champions, the first award. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'd like to ask uh, Linda O'Neill, the former executive director of the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth and our first keynote to come to the stage. And while they're coming up, I have to say that often we'll hear uh, leaders from a state say, we're innovators, we're leaders, we're first in the nation. And sometimes they're looked at as scan says, says who, says you. I have to say, I came to ACE Awareness Foundation as its executive director about four months ago, and I came to Tennessee from Columbia University as executive director of the National Center for Children in Poverty. And I came because Tennessee is absolutely known as a leader when it comes to issues around ACEs, that its legislators are supporting this work, that the people in the field and on the ground are doing phenomenal work, that there's innovative and trailblazing work done here. And so today I think is an example of that. And I wanna turn it over to Linda. 
Thank you, Renee, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I have a really short task this morning. I think that's part of retirement. You don't have to do so many things. Um, but um, it's my privilege to introduce our first speaker, Nat Kendall Taylor, who is the CEO of the Frameworks Institute, which is a communications think tank in Washington, D.C., and in your program is a more complete bio about Nat. Um, Frameworks has been instrumental in the Building Strong Brains Tennessee work and has really provided a lot of the information and the, um, and the messaging and the things that have been so essential to help us today celebrate successes and imagine possibilities. And um, on a side note, I have the privilege of serving on the board of the Frameworks Institute. Nat uses social science to better understand culture and cognition and to drive social change on a wide range of issues. Um, and he leads a team that investigates ways to apply innovative framing research to social issues and train experts on five continents to use the information they have gleaned from their research to better communicate social issues. He publishes widely in the popular and the professional press and recently had an article um, that was published with Dr. Dreisner. And Nat also lectures frequently in the United States. So I present to you Nat Kendall Taylor, CEO of Frameworks Institute. Hello, everyone. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Come on, it's not that early and I'm not that boring. How's everybody doing? Good, that's better. Thank you all very much. It's great to be back with you in Tennessee. I think it's been two years almost. We were trying to figure this out at dinner last night and we failed, our memories failed us, but I think about, um, about two years. Um, and I'm really excited to be with you here today to talk about this idea that you see up on the screen right now, which is how we can actually share messages, come together around frames to amplify the impact that we are all able to have. And I realize that the idea um, of looking at communications as a collaborative activity rather than as a competitive endeavor is probably against everything you have ever learned about strategic communications. But if you bear with me, if you stay with me and stay awake for the next 60 minutes, I will try to show you a different perspective on strategic communications, which brings me to my two goals here today, the first of which, and they both start with H, which is just kind of cute coincidence, not some framing magic trick that I'm doing on all of you. I never frame on friends. Um, <laughs> but the first H is to be helpful. I hope that I can take the work that, that we do at Frameworks and that we've done here in, in Tennessee over the last three years now and use it to, to improve a small but potentially important part of the work, the important work that you all are doing to help children and families experience better well-being, better outcomes, better long-term success. The second goal, the second H, is, uh, is humble. Uh, I realize that I don't do the important work on the ground that a lot of you all do, and that I come in here kind of from outside and work on a very small part of this, uh, this work that you all are doing, so hopefully I can be kind of humble in what I have to say and respect the expertise and, and acknowledge the work that you all are doing um, on these important issues. So I thought I would start by telling you why I'm here. And, and don't worry, I don't mean that in the deep or philosophical sense that you, could, that you could take that. I mean kind of why am I standing up here about to take the next 60 minutes of your lives talking about framing early childhood given that I have absolutely zero training in communication and I am not an expert in early childhood as other people who will come on this, this stage will be. Um, I do have three kids though. Uh, the middle of, of, of whom is a six-year-old boy who asked me the question the other day, uh, which I think is interesting in terms of early childhood development. He said, Dad, what kind of poison would kill someone the fastest? <laughs> to which I responded, of course, go ask your mother. Um, but that one, I think I may have underestimated that one. And if anybody, any of you experts in early childhood have a way that you can advise me to answer that question, I have a framing prize for you in my bag here at the end of the day that you can come and claim. So I'm not a, not a trained communicator, uh, and, and clearly, as I've just shown, not an expert in early childhood. Uh, what I am is an anthropologist, actually. And I do a particular kind of anthropology 
that is called psychological anthropology, which means that I study the way that culture influences how people think, how people take information and make meaning of it, how people process information, how people formulate and make decisions. And I do that at the Frameworks Institute with about, I used to say five, I used to say 10, and now I have to say 35 other framing geeks and dweebs from a variety of different disciplines, not just anthropologists, thankfully for the world, but also sociologists and linguists and political scientists and public health PhDs. And what we do and what I'm gonna be talking about today is that we study two different things. So first of all, we study public thinking, not public opinion, not how people answer a couple of poorly framed polling questions, but rather how people use culture to think deeply about the issues that we all care and work on and are trying to make change and progress towards. The second thing that we do is we study why well, the word frame is in our name, we study how the choices that we make as communicators, sometimes really small, seemingly insignificant choices, like the pronouns that we use, do you say us and them, or do you say we? Sometimes the really obvious things, like the values that we choose and use to endorse and argue for why our issue is of such importance, we study how those choices have effects, have impacts on what people think feel, and are willing to do as a result. And so I'm going to talk about those two things today, uh, and just to give you a sense of where I'm going to be going over the next 60 minutes, most of you have heard some kind of Frameworks content presentation before, and so I'm going to give you a very quick kind of refresher on three of what I think are the most important ideas to have kind of in your mind and at the front of your brains about framing. I'll then move on to make a couple of points, which is kind of the, the heart of the talk here, about patterns of culture that you may not know it, but that you are all up against, irrespective of the particular issues related to children and families that you are working on. And then we'll end on a bit of a, a, a kind of a pragmatic or optimistic tone, and I'll make some points about how you can all come together. And actually, the only hope of making this cultural change is if you all come together and work on moving forward and addressing and changing and shifting these patterns of thinking. So let's start with, surprise, surprise, the first one here, very logical. I'm gonna go through three, quickly, three things that are important to have, as I said, in the front of your minds, at the front of your brains, um, in terms of framing. And the first one is, and you all probably have heard this before, the idea that the way that we understand information, the way that we process it, the things that we do with it, is heavily dependent on the way that information is framed. So understanding is frame dependent. And I realize that sounds kind of like gobbledygook academic ease that someone with a PhD once said it actually is. So to translate that, what that means more simply is that it is not just what you say that matters in terms of the effects that you have, but it is how you say what you have to say. So I'm gonna give you a quick example of this, and I'll do this as I go through the three points. I won't ask you to take my word for any one of them. I'll give you some evidence that comes from work that we've done or that other social and behavioral scientists have done that really shows the point and emphasizes the idea that I'm trying to convey. This one actually comes from work on, on parenting and early childhood that we've done over the last three years, not in this country, but in Australia. So this allows you all in this room to have some productive distance from the depression that I'm about to, to pass on here. So what this field in Australia wants to be able to do is probably what people who work on parents here in, in Tennessee, here in the United States want to be able to do. They want to increase public support for the policies, the practices, the programs that will do a better job of supporting parents in doing the essential work that they do in raising the next generation, right? And so for a long time in Australia, about 15, maybe 20 years, the dominant frame for doing that, the dominant argument that people made is around effective parenting, right? That we need to do things to make sure that parents know the right things to do, right? All of these recommendations and guidelines and that we need to really do a better job in supporting effective parenting. So this was the dominant frame that the field, this is the dominant frame that the field has used for a long time. We were interested in seeing if instead of this frame as a way to talk about parenting, which you could kind of summarize as the wagging finger a little bit, right? You need to do these things as a parent. What if you switched it to this? 
a frame around child development that really emphasized the fact that to raise healthy and thriving children, parents need support. Okay, so let me show you what happened when you test those different frames. So what I'm about to take you through is a quantitative framing experiment. Uh, what you'll see in, in, in black bars will be that effective parenting frame, the frame that the field is using, and what you'll see in blue is that alternative, that child development frame. And what I'm gonna show you is the way that those two frames affect people's support for policies, and importantly, how they affect their behavioral intentions, their willingness to engage, their willingness to volunteer, kind of all of these more civic outcomes. And so when you run this experiment, so this was conducted with about 12,000 Australians, so a large experiment, and the way that it works is people get randomly assigned to read those different frames, and then they go through a set of questions that measures their uh, policy support and behavioral intentions. So when you run this, this is what you get. So I don't know how statistically inclined this audience is, but a quick stats lesson. Up is good, <laughs> down is bad. Right, so you see really powerfully here how the thing that the field has been doing for a long time with what I can tell you is a shocking amount of resources is actually having a negative effect. Not only is it a waste of breath and space, but it's actually driving support down for the policies that the field is advocating, and it's making people less willing, less likely to engage and behave civically. The better news is that this alternative frame of child development is having these strong and statistically significant positive effects. So again, the point here is that frames matter. Another way of looking at this is that the way that the field has been communicating is not having the effect that people think it is having. And another way of looking at it is through this great meme that I just found on the internet this morning. Right? This is kind of the effect that is going on here. <laughs> so that's the first point, that frames matter, that the, the, the choices that we make and how we say what we say frequently have a significant effect on what our messages, what our ideas, what our communications do. The second point is that if in this room we are all after, we share the goal of creating sustained, long-term change for families and children in this state, then I'm gonna argue we have to be concerned with culture. We have to be concerned with changing cultural patterns of reasoning, of thinking, of acting in terms of kids. Now, one of my favorite quotes about culture, even though the word culture is not in here, comes from Abraham Lincoln, who said that public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Against it, nothing can succeed. Whoever molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces judicial decisions. So the point here, and I think everyone in this room, I think the initiative really gets this point strongly and drives a lot of its work from it, is that people matter. The public matters. It's not just enough to change laws, pass legislation, and do that kind of work. And the, the theory of change that guides a lot of the, the initiative, Building Strong Brains Initiative, is that if we can change the way that we communicate as a field, and we can push that out strategically over time, we can actually change the public discourse. We can change the information air that people breathe when they hear, when they learn, when they think about kids and families. That when we change that information air over time, we can actually fundamentally, in very powerful ways, change culture. We can change the way that people think about kids and how they work and what they need and what we need to do to be able to better support them and improve well-being and outcomes, facilitate better learning, improve health. And that when we do that thinking work, when we do that culture change, we actually change the policy context. We create space, and not only space, but we put pressure behind those who are in policy-making policy positions to have to do different things when it comes to the policies and programs that they are in positions to decide and to make. So a lot of the work that we do with folks at the Frameworks Institute begins, people come to us thinking that 
people don't matter. That all we needed to do is go and make some legislative changes, flip some seats, kind of make that happen. And I'm here today to tell you that if this is all we do, we will always and forever do this. <laughs> as policymakers change, as parties come in and out, and that if we do not think about and place a lot of our attention on people and public thinking, we will not create sustained change on the issues that we are trying to move. So even for people who get that people matter, that the public is significant, that culture is something we need to be thinking about, most fields start their communications looking something like this. Right, so you have the early education people, they're telling their own story. You got the health folks, they're doing their own thing completely. You got this little kind of patch of early childhood people are doing something. You've got the child welfare people over here, the juvenile, and they're all telling wildly different and cacophonous stories. So this is a large enough group that this question will be rhetorical. But what do you think this is likely to do in terms of public thinking and culture? Nothing, someone said nothing. Even worse than nothing, if you are a member of the public and this is what you are hit with, this is what you are exposed to, you just go back further and more strongly into all the things that you already think. So what I think, and I think this is to me a really important and exciting point, what this work is about, and this does not happen in three years, this probably does not happen in five years, maybe in 10 years, is in moving from this to something that looks more like this. That you all can share frames, you all can tell common stories. It's not the same three magic words, because guess what, there aren't three magic words. But you can advance similar ideas about kids and what they need and how to support families that over time can change and move culture in a way that facilitates the kind of structural policy changes that you all are looking to achieve. So the third reason, unfortunately, that I have to end the the three set, the set of three on a bad note, is that you all have a problem. And I think that most of you in this room know this problem exists, and you are not alone in having this problem. It exists for any issue, for every issue in which people are working to change and improve outcomes. And it's a you say, they think problem, right? All of you in this room, I imagine at one time or another, have thought that you have the absolute perfect way of communicating about early childhood, of talking about families. You try it with two of your closest colleagues who are also deep issue experts, and it is awesome. Like, what could go wrong when it goes out to normal people? That's a joke, you get that one? Okay. And you find that when it does, one of two things happen. So first of all, that idea which was so powerful and gripping for you simply isn't for people who don't do your work. Secondly, and, and this is probably more problematic but still frequent, the idea that was so powerful for you and moved you and your colleagues in one direction actually takes people in the exact opposite direction. It achieves what in our field is called a backfire or a boomerang effect. So I want to show you what this looks like very quickly with an example that comes from work that we've done with our, our next speaker, Al Race from the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University, where Experts on early childhood say things like this. And this is actually a direct quote from someone involved in the work that we've done with the Center on the Developing Child at the Harvard University, at Harvard University. Um, and they, they say things like persistent stress can derail development and have negative long-term effects on health and well-being. And I have, to anonymize this quote, I have changed one word. In the original quote, negative was deleterious but I've changed that to be, to be mildly less obnoxious and obvious in the point that I'm about to make. But so for, for, for folks that, that Al works with, for folks who are experts on the development uh, of, of, of young kids, this is true, right? There's a lot of science now across a lot of disciplines over a long period of time that would support this statement. Unfortunately, when this statement goes out to people who are not the folks that Al works with, people who are not experts on early childhood, you get things that look and sound like this. Life's hard, it's supposed to be hard. You know, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, the, all the bad cliches you can think of. I mean, there's, there's been people that have come from absolutely nothing to make it 
in whatever society's eyes deem success. So I don't know, it's the, the, the stage up here really shakes when, when that guy talks. <laughs> but I don't know if everybody could hear that. Um, and if you couldn't, I'll just make it really clear. Like that that we just heard, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, is not what this expert intended when he or she opened his or her mouth to deliver this message. So something's going on between the delivery, the intention of the message, and the way that it's landing, its reception, its, its impact. And that thing, that mystery agent that stands between, that accounts for this lost in translation moment, is culture. Not in the kind of Indiana Jones external artifact kind of archaeology culture, which is what my parents still think I do, <laughs> but rather culture in mind. Culture as a set of shared ways that we have of thinking about issues, of patterns of reasoning, of assumptions that we make when we're presented with information that become active and shape how we make sense of that information. So in this case, there are cultural understandings, what my people, what anthropologists call cultural models of stress that become active when this expert delivers this information, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, that then shape how this gentleman responds and thinks about early childhood and adversity. So just in summary, or before summary, sorry, I forgot I have another presidential quote in here. This is actually my new, it's not a new quote, it's from 1962 at Yale University, but it's a, one that I've recently come across, quote, about culture. Again, even though JFK doesn't say culture. So the idea is that the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. So it's not like that gentleman with the baseball cap is sitting there saying, I hate kids. Let's do things that mess them up. He's not, trust me but he has understandings of stress and adversity which get in the way of him understanding that message of processing that information in the way in which it was intended for the effects and the outcomes that it was used to try to have. So in summary, the three points are how you say, what you say matters. It's not just the content, it's the frames, it's the choices that you make that if we share frames, we can amplify our impact rather than each trying to tell our own story and viewing communications as a competitive activity which splinters and sacrifices the effect that we're able to have. And finally, culture is always there, complicating your job as communicators. So with those three ideas in mind, and we're gonna go back and kind of have to call these to mind as we continue. So I wanna just, everyone take a, a mental picture of, of this quick summary. I'm going to move and talk a little bit about culture for the rest of our time. And I'm going to talk about culture not just from the work that we've done with, with Al and other folks or in, here, uh, in this state of Tennessee on early childhood, but I'm actually going to pull on work that we've done, that I've done over the last 12 years, that Frameworks has done over the last 20 years on over 30 different social issues. Issues like mental health and justice and addiction and early childhood and environmental health and poverty and homelessness and all those issues. And I'm going to look across those issues to highlight what I think are three very important things for everyone in this room to be aware of, to consider as you go out of this room and engage seriously and intentionally in your work as communicators. And the idea here is that no matter what issue you work on, whether you're in kind of a pure child health lane or whether you're working on education or whether you're working on, on child welfare and foster care, there are a set of ideas that are incredibly robust in American culture which you are up against. And the problem is that these ways of thinking, these deep cultural tropes, these meta-narratives, are eating your issues. You come up against them, 
and they impede your ability to progress on any goal that you are working on. So we're gonna spend most of the rest of our time digging into these three ideas, and I'm gonna name them. You probably can't guess them from my beautiful icons here. The first one is the idea of individualism. The sense that the world is the way that it is, that outcomes are the way that they are, as an exclusive, myopic, and narrow result of whether an individual works hard, has discipline, exerts willpower. And the problem with this perspective is if that is your view on the world, there's a whole lot of stuff that really matters. Structures, society, resources that are out of your view. The second one, which I have to say has grown incredibly more ripe in my 12 years working on framing and studying American culture, is the idea of fatalism. That the world exists as a constellation of deep, dark, dire problems about which nothing can really be done. And in today's world, the way that Americans think about government is a deep, <laughs> severely problematic, and intertwined with this sense of fatalism, that government is inept, corrupt, incapable of meaningful change and improving outcomes. So I want just to be clear, if you didn't get the tone, I'm not endorsing these ways of thinking, I'm describing them. And last and not least, what I call tribalism, what many people call us versus them. The world is essentially a fixed, limited pool or pie of resources, and that by definition, if we think of the world this way, any more for you and yours, by definition means less for me and mine. And a very powerful, which today is becoming increasingly uh, called the, the P word, polarization, right? This increasing sense that there are camps and groups and, and essentially the world is a contest or a competition between me and mine and you and yours. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take each of these three on. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it. You'll see a pattern here that I go through with each of these cultural models, each of these cultural myths, where I'm gonna show you what they look like coming out of the mouths of Americans, talking about different social issues. And then, just to not leave you as depressed as I get when I watch these videos, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sense of how framing and sharing frames is actually part of the solution to these problems. So we're gonna start with individualism. What you're gonna see here is about two and a half minutes of people across a variety of different social issues, you kind of hear the issues, um, answering open-ended questions in a way that makes it blatantly, painfully clear that they are applying this cultural model of individualism, that this cultural model is really powerfully guiding their thinking. So this is your chance to kind of pretend to be anthropologists for about two and a half minutes and realize that it is neither as sexy nor as cool as Indiana Jones or Margaret Mead would have you believe. And so I want you to be on the lookout for culture here. I want you to notice the patterned ways that people are responding to these questions and how those patterned ways are evidencing this deeper strain, this deeper thread of culture around individualism. Everybody ready? Here we go. Starting off, I wanted to ask you why you think it is that some kids end up doing well in school and some kids don't. I think it depends on the child. It depends on the child. Different people's minds work differently. I guess I think that everybody's different. Because kids have different learning styles and abilities. Why do you think that some people have more difficult lives than others? You work for what you want. It's up to each individual as an in themselves to really dictate where their lives are gonna go. Because you can't do everything for everybody. You know, willpower seems to have a lot to do with it. I think you gotta, you gotta believe in yourself. It's the mind and the determination on what they wanna do and whether or not they go for it. I was in foster care and I'm still focused and I'm still on point, so it doesn't, it depends on the individual. If someone you think has a leg up on you, 
then you just gotta work twice as hard. This should drive you more to like succeed. Uh, I believe that anybody can do anything they want. What could be done to help more people do well economically in this country? Well, I think people have to want to help themselves first. People have to help themselves. It still takes that individual person to want it for themselves. Ultimately, how we pick ourselves up, you know, and live our days is, is a choice in our hands. I think it's all a part of the, you know, attitudes and, and temperaments. The failures are those that choose to fail. You know right from wrong, it's a choice they make. Some people, I think, make their own trouble. I think some people make their lives more difficult by the decisions that they make. Who is responsible for oral health? You are. I mean, you have to take care of your teeth, you have to take care of your mouth. What do you think needs to happen for us to do well overall as we get older? Gotta keep yourself active. They need to stay active, both mentally and physically. I think you need to keep active, you need to keep moving. Taking better care being of their health, being proactive. I also think that it is a decision that an individual makes. I think it's personal choice. I just think it's the easiest thing that's available to the individual. I just think it's all choices. I mean, really and truly, it's... Mm, I just think it's a choice. So did you see the individuals in there? So that last woman is one of my favorite participants who I have ever interviewed because you can actually hear her think. So she's trying to reason through what else may be important here, and she goes, hmm, I think it's just choice. So the idea here is that as communicators, when people see individual causes for the issues that we are trying to work on, their attention gets channeled in a very particular way when they're asked to think about solutions. So if you think about individual causes, your attention in terms of solutions goes to individuals. And you hold those individuals responsible for the remediation of the problems that exist. So it becomes about trying harder, making better decisions, exerting more will. Now, I'm not up here trying to say that there is no role for individuals in the social issues that we work on. I am here to say that there's a whole other part of this. There's another side of, of these issues that we work on, which is social or structural in nature. And when people can see and think about social causes, they come up with dramatically different solutions, right? Social causes yield public solutions. The problem, in, in my view, in terms of American culture now, and, and this is not like since the last two years or the last four years, is that this is the way this equation works in people's minds. That the individualism is so much stronger and more robust and so much more exercised and practiced than this social cause which you can barely see. And our job, one of our jobs as communicators, is not to say that individual will and agency don't matter, but it's to communicate in a very intentional way to provide better balance in terms of these ways of thinking as they exist in the cultural milieu. Okay, so that's individualism. Let's move to my personal favorite, that's being facetious fatalism, and let's look at what this looks like coming out of the mouths and from the minds of Americans. So same drill here, this is about two and a half minutes, people answering questions about a wide range of social issues in ways that evidence the fact that there is this deep, powerful bedrock of fatalism in American culture today. What do you think we can do about that? It's a good question. Um, 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 literally, there is no way to make it better. You got to piss the less of you know two evils. And once the damage is done, I don't really see it how they could really fix it. Rent's going to be expensive no matter what. There's always been people complaining of the price. So Come what do you on. say? It's the whole system is not working. It ain't working. There are elements in society that just feel that they can do what they want to do. I love the government helping, but the government can't fix things. There's two things we have to do, is pay taxes and die. What do I think could be done to prevent it? I'm not so sure you, you can. Had we gone back, 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 before we built this society, mm -hmm. you know, then okay, but mm -hmm. I mean, we're already here. Sometimes I actually think it's just meant to be. I think to a point, if you have screwed up parents, you're gonna have screwed up kids. If you are somewhere where there's always crime and 
you know, you live that on a daily day basis, you kind of fall into that. Mm. I don't know if anything can be done. Wait for the next generation. People don't realize in a billion years, you know, the sun's eventually going to consume us and it's going to be the end. I don't know if everyone could hear the last guy. The sun will eventually consume us and that will be the end. And that's a bit, you know, that's, that's in there at the end for a bit of drama and effect. But that is incredibly characteristic of how people think about our ability to meaningfully address social issues. And I apologize for whatever happened to the video. You missed my favorite woman from Kansas who said we have to do two things in life, pay taxes and die. Um, but this is incredibly strong, right? This is an incredibly, I would argue, increasingly strong stream of culture in our society today. So let me tell you a little bit, uh, show you a little bit more about this and how it works and also provide you with a bit of a sense that there is hope, there is an antidote for this, for this type of fatalism. So um, we've done a lot of work on the issue of child maltreatment, of, of abuse and neglect, and have found very interesting uh, results. So this is another experiment in which I'm gonna show you three different frames and the outcomes are along the, the bottom of the screen here. So we're gonna be charting people's support for policy solutions. People sense that the problem of child abuse is a social one rather than an individual family one. People's senses of efficacy, which is kind of the antidote, the other side of fatalism, the sense that there are things that can be done, and finally their behavioral intentions. So the first bar is gonna show you the results when we tested the value of social responsibility, when we told people that it is our collective, our social responsibility to address this issue. So you can see positive results across, across all of these outcomes. That's good news, we were happy about that. We then chose, kind of masochistically, to see what happens if you did what the field tends to do. So the field, I don't know, many of you are probably familiar with this field, but the field of child maltreatment tends to do two things. They tend to overemphasize, or they tend to lead and go strong with prevalence facts, showing how prevalent it is, and then they tend to use examples that show, normally about sexual abuse, that show how horrible the problem is. So when you do that, when you kind of add to this value prevalence statistics and a short snippet of an example, all that positive effect evaporates. So you've overwhelmed people. You've convinced them of the fact that it is a problem, but I've just said in our culture, we think there are lots of problems. We don't think there is a lot to do about any of them. The hopeful part is that in another frame to this combination of value and prevalence facts, we added a short description of a solution. It's about three sentences long, and when you do that, your effect comes back. Not only does it come back, but it's actually greater than just the value by itself. So part of the idea here is that in our culture, we are incredibly practiced in thinking about problems. We are incredibly unpracticed in thinking about solutions. Part of your job, every single person in this room, is to give people more practice in thinking about the power and potential of solutions to improve the issues that you all work on. So let's go last but not least to the cultural model of tribalism. Same exercise here. I'm gonna show you some videos across issues, open-ended questions. You can see how people respond and in those responses evidence the existence of this stream of culture. Here we go. Why would a school be underperforming? Well, what I think of, I don't know if it's right or wrong, is that there's a lot of, a lot of foreigners here. There's a, there's a lot of people who aren't citizens who are getting a lot more than the citizens are getting. When you apply for like school and colleges, um, just like diversity-wise, they look for people who are not white. The, the schools are, are typically black. They don't have the parent participation either. Would you say there are advantages to being older? Probably it would be hard for them to adapt to this newer world or new technology and things like this. They start becoming a little more feeble. They're alone. 
their spouses die. Our society isn't betting on them as much. When you don't see them, you don't really think about them, most people. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. so it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. What comes to mind when you think about the immigration system? Everybody from everywhere is coming to the U.S. Overflood of Mexicans here, you know? They cross the border and stuff. People don't follow guidelines and they try to come here illegally. Illegal. They have no way of tracking them. They take jobs away from hardworking Americans. They'll come over here and take jobs from everybody else. I, I believe it's taking jobs away from people here that need to be employed. They're getting all the good jobs. They'll come in the country and work for less money. The illegals is getting everything when they come into the country. They come over, they get what they want. Taking away from those who that, that, that are really our citizens. Does where a person lives affect how they do economically? You're always going to have poor neighborhoods. You're always going to have rich neighborhoods, no matter where you are in the world. Some people are very fortunate and some people aren't. Like if you stay in like a really nice, nice neighborhood, you've got to have the money to be able to stay there. You're going to going to have the uh, the Volkswagen and the Rolls Royce from the next door neighbor. Uh, I, I don't think that they would feel comfortable. So if I played that again and I asked you to do one thing, Notice the pronouns, they and them, across those issues. I've done this a number of times, and I always notice the pronouns, and it is a powerful experience. The ease at with, with which people otherize on these issues, and these become fundamentally about us versus them issues. So I want to give you a couple of examples that really drive home this point, the first of which doesn't come kind of allows you to have a little bit of productive distance from this and realize that this is not actually us versus them, is not a uniquely American issue. Um, comes from a study uh, that was conducted with 964 Danish politicians. I love any slide that allows me to start with 964 Danish politicians. This is going to be a good one, right? So this is one that explores uh, people's response, Danish politicians' response to frames about education. So they took this sample and they kind of split it into two. Half of the sample got messages about school performance that were framed just with the name of the school. So the, you know, Copenhagen School for the, I don't know, I don't know what the names actually were. So just names of places, names of schools. And then they gave people data about school performance and they were interested in how accurate the politicians were in interpreting that data. And with a striking degree of accuracy, people could correctly understand and interpret the data. That's great. Danish politicians, super smart, super kind of numerate. They could do it. The other half of the sample got the same information, except it was tagged with whether that school was a public or a private school, which in Denmark is a very significant kind of political, ideological marker. And they found that people were wildly inaccurate. They interpreted the information in inaccurate ways to fit their ideology. And so the people who ran this study thought, well, just maybe we didn't give them enough information. So they increased the amount of information by three, or in some cases, five times, and the effect got even worse. Right? So there are all these cues in discourse that we have become incredibly attuned to that the minute we hear them, boom, we're in our camps. Boom, we're polarized. Boom, the issue is one of us versus them. And so I think part of the way out of this is over time to start talking more about ideas and to start talking less about issues. So in some other work around poverty, this is in the United States, people, the experimenters, used this frame of welfare. And they found that when presented with this frame, guess what? People immediately polarize. They immediately go into their camps, and they are incredibly closed to receiving and working with new information. So in another part of the experiment, they talked about the issue as being one of low social mobility. So more of an idea and less of kind of a, re a recognized tag word. And lo and behold, they found low defense of the current system and high openness to new ideas and the ability to work with information. And this holds across political parties. 
right? So just the inkling of there being some antidote, some way of combating this us versus them tribalism that is becoming rampant in our culture. So now we're on to the last probably five minutes in which I'm gonna make an appeal to you all about the fact that there are things that we can do in this room together to confront, to roll back, to shift, to make room for other ways of thinking among these increasingly dominant streams of American culture. So if we want to change these things, and this is essentially what I think about the Building Strong Brains initiative is about, we have to have two things. The first thing is a framing strategy. We have to have a message. We have to have a story. We have to have a meta-narrative that we can share. And I'm not going to go into this in any great depth, but this, by and large, is the content that a huge number of people in this state have been trained to use and deliver in their work. This is the kind of core story of adversity and child development. The second thing that we need, so we have the content, the framing, the, the, the story, right? But that cannot do anything unless we have a communications or a mobilization strategy to use to get that narrative, to get those frames out into the world. And having done these two strategies on a number of different social issues for the last 12 years, I thought what I would end on is a set of ideas that I think are important to keep in mind if you are going to do, if you are going to go forward and continue to do this communication strategy component of your work. So I think about these as effectiveness factors, as kind of key criteria in an effective mobilization or communication strategy. And the first is that repetition is the name of the game. When you've gotten to the point where you are sick of saying it, it is then and only then just starting to have its effect on culture. The second is one of the meta points that I've hopefully made. It's that kind of disparate, cacophonous arrows moving into one direction. Is that communications at this level of this type is not a competitive activity. It's not your issue versus their issue. It's not your organization and its brand versus that organization and its brand. But that fundamentally, we have to find ways of sharing and collaborating and collectively driving these messages forward. Third, and I think this is probably an unpopular one, but it is my role and, and mission to make, is that this is not another six months of work. This is not a wicked awesome bumper sticker. This is long-term social movement work. This is about getting messages out in a concerted dose over a long period of time in which they can begin to have their effects in shifting and changing culture. Fourth is finding partners who are actually at the nodes and nexuses of the audiences that you are trying to influence. To get those messages to flow from influential people who those you are trying to influence will listen to. Fifth, and this is something that Al is gonna be talking about, Al Race, who's the next speaker at 11 o'clock, um, who has thought with the Harvard Center on the Developing Child really creatively about channels of dissemination is to think out of the box in terms of how you get your messages in front of those people you are trying to influence. The more channels of influence that you have over time, the more effective you will be in this culture change work. Sixth, and I think, um, I think this, is, this is something that this group is starting to do, is to think about having some visible frame champions in this work? Who's gonna be out front with high levels of visibility who can be recruited to carry these frames and deliver them in creative and authentic ways to different audiences? And last but not least, and I think you all have done this, which is why I'm ending on it, 
to create early success. You need examples where this has worked, which will make it infinitely easier for others to do it and for it to continue to work. So I'm going to end with uh, a quick kind of good news, bad news scenario here. And I'm going to lead with the bad news so that I can end on the good news. So the bad news in this presentation is that everyone in this room is up against these same cultural models. The good news is that everyone in this room is up against these same cultural models. Which means that if you can come together as communicators, you have the ability to create a tide that lifts all of your boats. And I am here to tell you that I don't care what organization you come from and how much power and how high your kind of pedestal and big your microphone is, as a single organization, you will probably not change culture. As a group of organizations, you have the power and the ability to do so. So one more piece of bad news is that we are talking about culture here. And you don't need an anthropologist up here to tell you that culture is, is strong and it is durable and it is persistent. The good news is that culture can and does change. And it changes in response to the stories that we collectively tell. So to end with a quote, this is one of my other <laughs> new old quotes from Ivan Illich, who's a, an Austrian philosopher, polymath, said that neither revolution nor reformation can ultimately change a society. Rather, you must tell a more powerful tale, one so persuasive that it sweeps away the old myths and becomes the preferred story. And that is our work in this room. That is your work going forward. And so as I encouraged you to do last time I was in front of you, I hope that all of you go out of this room and frame on. Thank you very much. Were you going to take questions? Sure. We okay. I think we have 10 minutes. Yeah, so we do have 10 minutes, so we'll uh, open it up for questions. I have a question for you. So the people who were filmed, what were they told about how this was going to be used? Who was posing the questions to them? So um, as a group of social scientists, we pass all of our work through a human subjects panel. So this is work and consent that meets kind of peer-reviewed academic standards for, for conducting research that involves human subjects. And they are told that their responses uh, will be featured in presentations like this, but will never be divorced from an explanation um, by the folks who did that work of what was going on. So they are presented in those cases with really broad, open-ended questions. As you saw, one of, the, um, one of my colleagues asked one of the people, so kind of, what do, you, uh, what do you think about oral health? Or um, what do you think about uh, immigrants coming to this country? Or what do you think influences how a child learns and why one child might succeed in their education and another might not? So broad, open-ended questions. And, phrased in a variety of different ways, and what we're really interested in is kind of what people bring to the way that they answer those questions. There's other work that we do that I haven't shown you, which is that same kind of, um, same kind of method, except we're actually putting frames, values, metaphors, messengers in front of people to observe how those different ways of thinking about the, the issue actually affect the way that they respond to those questions. Thanks. So do other people have questions? Yes. And if you could, well, not scream, but if you could just there's a go. Mic, okay, there's a so mic coming behind you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. I was wondering if you could give an example of when framing has effectively changed mm -hmm. culture in the past. 
So I'm, I'm going to try to do this in a way that doesn't steal the thunder from, from the next speaker, which is, which is an example. So I, and there's, there's evaluation evidence uh, over time to suggest this, but I actually think on early childhood, there has been framing efforts that have led to some real and measurable change in culture, in the way that Americans think about kids and what they need and, and, and what's required to support them. So 20 years ago, early childhood was not the issue in public understanding as it is now. Um, it was uh, always first to go when things needed to be chopped and cut out of budgets mm -hmm. because people essentially thought that what happens early is of little consequence. Kids don't remember. They don't have real emotions. If there's a time for something bad to happen to them, early is it. And I'm saying this kind of anecdotally, but that has changed in American culture. People at a base level understand that there is something. They may not understand exactly what it is or how it works, but there is something about early childhood that is important for how things work later on. And therefore, as a society, we need to pay more attention. We need to place greater salience on that period of life. Now, I think there's plenty of work and progress still needs to be made on that issue, but I think early childhood and development is one where we can point to some framing efforts that have gone on and have been sustained over time that have actually put us in a different place now in terms of American culture and thinking about kids than where we were 15, 20 years ago. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yep. So, I mean, a great example, and again, I feel like I'm taking all of the, stealing all of the thunder from the next speaker. But, um, so one of the metaphors, uh, and it's not a completely unproblematic metaphor, but one of the metaphors that has been effective in counteracting the, what you saw in the, the video with the guy in the baseball cap, the kind of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, is the idea of toxic stress. That there are multiple kinds of stress. There is tolerable stress, right? There is the stress that, uh, that kind of, is bad, but we can get through it with the presence of a supportive, uh, positive relationship. But there's this other kind of stress that happens kind of chronically and is unbuffered that can lead to development issues and, and, and derail some of these processes that are going on. So that, that metaphor, kind of comparing certain kinds of stress to something toxic, immediately shifts people out of that kind of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger mindset and makes people able to see that there are multiple kinds of stress, and not all of it is the stuff against which you push to develop your resilience. Yeah. Yep. It's a great question, so I'll repeat it in case anybody didn't hear it. So when we asked those questions, the, the question was, does anybody respond in a way that, that evidences some other non-individualistic way of thinking? And I think it's, it's a great question and allows me to make a really important point, is that everyone you saw in that video has other ways of thinking other than individualism. People can think collectively. People can think about barn raising and, and kind of coming together around issues, and people can think that what surrounds us shapes us. The problem is that those ways of thinking over time have become backgrounded to the point where our first, our strongest, our most exercised cultural muscle is individualism. So that stuff is all there and people bring it up from time to time with certain cues, but it's the dominance, the strength, the persistence, the predictability of that individualism as a way of thinking about a whole host of issues that is what I'm trying to comment on here. So I could show you videos where, if you talk to them long enough, if you give them kind of conversational cues, those same people can get to different places in their thinking. But the problem is that that individualism remains, I guess the best way to think about it, is kind of top and front of mind. So please give Nat another round of applause. <laughs> And 
And clearly, intuitively, we know that how we say what we say matters. However, getting a better understanding of the science of telling better stories, uh, of framing, is what we need to do to build the public will for policy change. And I think uh, Nat has given us a great deal to uh, talk about. So one last time. <laughs>